Hello guys and welcome back to another video. Back on July 26, 2005, Apple released its last revision of the iBook G4, and that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Also, big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Alright, I've got the laptop in a box out there. I think it's time we open it, and honestly, it looks like it's in pretty bad condition. Let's take a look. Using my trusty knife, I made my way into the mailing box. I've bought from this seller before many times. I'm kind of curious as to where he keeps getting all these really old laptops. This one has definitely been heavily used. Taking a look at the specification sticker, we can confirm that this is indeed the last 14-inch iBook revision with a G4 1.42 GHz processor. Cosmetically, there are quite a few scratches and marks. With any luck, some cut and polish will help remove a lot of it. The keyboard also looks slightly yellowed, but this could clean up pretty well. With all the cosmetic wear aside, does it still work fine? Powering up the iBook for the first time, we are greeted with the boot chime, and about 50 seconds later, the install video plays. I'll have to mute the audio, as the track might be copyrighted. Either way, just imagine someone went a little crazy with the pitch bend on their synthesizer. With the system loaded up, we can see that it has 768 megabytes of RAM and a 1.42 GHz processor. The battery also seems to be holding a decent amount of charge and has a cycle count of only 129. I'd be curious to see if this is the original battery or not. Pretty impressive if it is. Either way, let's turn it off and give it a much needed cleaning. I'm going to start with the lid of the laptop that has the most amount of cosmetic wear. Starting off, I wiped down the surfaces with some eucalyptus oil. Scrubbing all the affected areas had little effect, so out came the cut and polish. I put a small amount of it over the scratches, leaving it to dry for about 10 minutes. Using a microfiber cloth, I began rubbing in a circular motion. I really should invest in a motorized buffing wheel, as it kind of hurt my hands after a while. For a better result, I'd recommend using polish that's designed for plastics and not car bodies. This is just what I happened to have on hand while making the video. The result after the first round of polishing was quite good, but I'm definitely not finished yet. For a second time, I applied polish to the affected areas on the lid. I should have also kept a window open as the smell was quite strong. With another pass, the top lid looked so much better. I may have introduced more fine scratching, but this is definitely an improvement. For the final time, I went over the lid. At this point, any more passes wouldn't really be making that much of a difference. There were some marks I couldn't seem to remove, but this is good enough for me. To start cleaning the underside of the laptop, I used some eucalyptus oil. This once again had little effect on the scratching, which was more than likely caused due to some of the rubber feet not being present. I'll have to borrow some off another iBook that I've been using for parts. Once again, the polish has helped quite a bit. The keyboard was very grubby. Not exactly something you want to be touching. Have no fear, a healthy dose of eucalyptus oil is here. As I always say, please clean any secondhand laptop that you buy. They can be quite unsanitary. To get around the sides of the keycaps, I used some isopropyl alcohol on a toothbrush. If there were any germs on these keys, they're probably gone now. To clean off the display, I gently wiped it with a damp paper towel. I then followed that up with a spray of lens cleaner and a microfiber cloth. After cleaning the display, sadly it appears to have mold forming inside the LCD panel itself. It is somewhat noticeable, but I don't have a replacement 14 inch panel I can replace it with. When the system is on, you can sort of see where new mold patches are forming. Although I don't plan on leaving this outside in a tropical environment, so it shouldn't get much worse. Back in 2005, if you went to Apple's website, you'd be greeted with the enticing offer of an iBook for only 999 US dollars. The cheaper option was for a slightly less powerful but smaller 12-inch model, which actually has the same screen resolution of 1024 by 768 that the 14-inch model has. The iBook line was definitely a much cheaper option when compared to the G4 PowerBooks of the time. Regardless, this iBook looks a lot better now. Before we see exactly what 15 years of torture has done to the internals of this laptop, let me introduce you to today's sponsor Skillshare an online learning community with thousands of great classes with topics ranging from illustration, animation, music production, filmmaking to web development. 
A class I found very insightful was Jordi Vanderput's advanced editing in Adobe Premiere. Simplifying your workflow and having well-organized folder structures are so important. Believe me, after years of editing both professionally and on my own projects, fundamentals like these are key to you being a successful and efficient editor. So if you're an aspiring editor, I would definitely recommend checking this one out. If you're hungry to learn and discover something new, Skillshare has so much to offer. There's no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. An annual subscription is less than $10 per month, giving you access to a diverse library of classes. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership, allowing you to explore your creativity. So why not join this great online learning community today? If any of you have taken one of these apart before, you'd know how time consuming it can be. To get to the hard disk and heat sinks nearly requires you to disassemble the whole laptop. Luckily, you can easily upgrade the RAM, which is something you can't take for granted these days. With all the outer screws removed, I started to unclip the bottom casing. Using a guitar pick, I made my way around the edges. I would strongly suggest that you follow a tutorial and keep track of all the different screws. Lifting up the plastic reveals some surface corrosion. I'm a little bit scared to see what lies within, to be honest. To get the metal shield off, I removed a variety of different Phillips head screws. I really get the feeling that Apple didn't want you to get inside these machines. With the screws removed, we get our first look at the underside of the logic board. It looks like the magnesium frame has started to form a bit of surface corrosion. I began by removing the single fan, which was rather surprisingly completely dust free. To get access to the other side of the logic board, several more Phillips head screws had to be removed. I could then carefully lift up the top casing and detach the trackpad and speaker connectors. No, we're still not in yet. There's yet another metal shield between us and the board. It's not too hard to see why these were pretty sturdy laptops. I mean, they're built like tanks. There we have it, the internals of Apple's last iBook G4. To remove the heatsink, we first have to dislodge the 56K modem, which is held in place by two Phillips head screws. After also removing the Airport Extreme card, which finally came as standard and not as an optional extra, the CPU heatsink could now be removed. Holding it in place were not only Phillips head screws, but a pair of 4mm nuts with springs above the CPU. With a bit of wriggling, we get our first look at the processors in this laptop. Here we've got the PowerPC 7447A CPU, which is clean due to thermal pads being used instead of paste. I actually wasn't expecting this. In hindsight, I should have done more research. The graphics processor used a 1mm thick thermal pad, which I can't simply bridge with thermal paste. Locally, there aren't any shops that sell thermal pads that are designed to transfer the heat of a processor. The closest thing I could find were 0.5mm thick at JCAR, but these are not designed for this kind of use. Since I was running out of time and had a deadline to get this video done, I couldn't wait for some new thermal pads to arrive from somewhere online. Using some isopropyl alcohol, I began trying to clean the surfaces of the metal shields. It looks as if the surfaces were more tarnished than what I would call rusted, so I don't believe they'll become much worse over time. Gaps between the casing have accumulated a fair amount of gunk, which was rather satisfying to remove. Some of this may be leftover polish from the cleaning I performed earlier though. While I had the chance, I cleaned off all the casing's pieces. Aside from the corrosion, internally there was next to no dust. Maybe this laptop was used in a laboratory with a lot of chemicals. The thermal pad that was used with the CPU was actually a lot thinner. The gap where the die actually made contact with the heatsink was so small that I feel pretty confident using thermal paste here. I wonder why Apple opted to use pads instead of paste in these iBooks. The pad used for the graphics processor is a lot thicker. Since the die is quite small, I thought I would reuse part of the thermal pad that never made contact with the processor. It's very malleable, so I'm going to recycle it. Before I reapply the thermal paste and reuse one of the thermal pads, I made sure to clean off the copper surfaces with isopropyl alcohol. This 1mm pad will help bridge the gap between the two surfaces. This is by no means the best method, however it's all I could come up with at the time of filming. Since there was still going to be a very small gap between the CPU, I applied a liberal amount of thermal paste. With any luck, this will keep the system running cool. With the heatsink securely back in place, it was now time to reassemble it all. While the laptop was open, I decided to put some thread locker on the hinge screws to stop them becoming loose in the future. This laptop has definitely seen a hard life. It's not exactly the best example of a late model iBook G4. 
The casing is still quite worn. To completely remove the surface rust on the frame, I'd have to completely strip it down and sand it. I did, however, put in a 1GB memory module, which will bring the total to 1.5GB. Overall, it's definitely in better condition now than when I received it. So, does it still work after the lengthy disassembly? The reassuring boot chime suggests that I didn't completely destroy it. Once we were in macOS, it was good to see that the operating system accepted the RAM upgrade. This is the maximum amount of memory this laptop is capable of having. I downloaded the correct version of 10.4 Fox browser, but it simply wouldn't run on this system. I did have a bit more luck with Camino, but it struggled to load the YouTube website, or any website for that matter. The iBook G4 has a 32 megabyte ATI Radeon 9550 AGP graphics processor. Running at the lowest settings at a resolution of 640x480, it can somewhat handle Halo Combat Evolved. Running an older game, Quake 2, with the highest settings at 1024x768 resolution, it performs quite fluidly. I'll be honest, that's not really much of an achievement though. It's not very powerful, especially by today's standards, but it has a nice keyboard and was pretty good value when it came out 15 years ago. It may seem quite thick, especially compared to the titanium PowerBook G4, but alongside the clamshell iBook G3, the difference is truly night and day. A lot really changed in the span of only six years. So there we have Apple's last iBook. This was actually also the last generation that Apple used PowerPC-based processors before switching to Intel, and they supported these with software for about two or three years. In fact, Apple is going to be introducing ARM-based processors to their laptops and desktops in the near future, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you've liked the video, feel free to leave a like, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. Also, a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time.